Hi everyone, welcome to microbiology. We're in chapter one of our microbiology. In this chapter, we're gonna be looking at the origins of microorganisms. We'll talk about microbiology as it pertains to humans. And we'll talk about the microbial world, the different types of microbes that we study in this class, including non-living viruses and prions. So the Earth is about 4.6 billion years old, and we know that microbes um, arose around 3.5 billion years ago. Microbes have been here since then, and they're still here today, and they actually help to produce the environment conducive for life as we know it, the animals, the plants, um, the modern microbes that are all here now um, evolved from those ancestral bacteria. We didn't always know there were microorganisms. Uh, a lot of scientists hypothesized that there were microscopic agents that caused disease or that caused different um, activities but we didn't actually know that there were microbes in our air or in our bodies. Um, the study of microorganisms, or the study of microbiology is the study of microorganisms, and we need tools to study these microbes, including microscopes. We had to learn how to culture these organisms, and now today we can use molecular genetics to identify and categorize these organisms. So the field of microbiology was not born until the late 1600s. And Tony van Leeuwenhoek is um, considered the father of microbiology. And this is because he is one of the first individuals credited to making a microscope. Not only did he make a microscope, um, it was only a single lens microscope, but not only did he make the microscope, but he is also one of the first individuals to see um, tiny organisms, protozoans, and even possibly bacteria. So this was a Dutch drapist. He made very fine drapes for wealthy individuals, and to make sure that those drapes were perfect, he invented a microscope so that he could see if there were any mis mistakes within his um, sewing. And it made him relatively wealthy. I mean, he sold a lot of drapes. But he also got interested in looking at other substances. So he thought, well, you know, I can see if there's a mistake in my um, sewing. What? would I see if I took um, some teeth scraping? So um, in 1600s, they didn't brush their teeth very much. Um, that wasn't a thing. So he took some of the um, material, the plaque off of his teeth, and he looked at it under a microscope, and he drew what he saw. And then he thought, well, that's really cool. I wonder what's in water. So he went down to the pond and he got some pond water and he looked at the pond water and he saw these little things moving around really fast. And he thought, whoa, what are those? They are microscopic animals. I'll call them animolecules. That's where that term came from. He even looked at semen because he thought, well, I wonder what's in semen. And he saw sperm with his microscope. So, I mean, he looked at a lot of different structures and he published, that's the big deal. He published his findings. So let me show you his microscope. There we go. So this is what his microscope looks like. Very um, small, one lens, can magnify, you know, about 200 times um, whatever you're looking at. And, you know, you're going to look through what with one eye through the lens and you're going to use just the sunlight to actually um, see whatever it is you're looking at. Another individual who also was credited with building microbiology, the field of microbiology, was Robert Hooke. 
Um, he was one of the first individuals to make a, to produce a microscope, a compound microscope. Um, he was looking at cork under his microscope and he noticed that cork had these little tiny cells. That's what he called these. And the reason he called them cells was because he lived in a monastery and the rooms that he lived in were called cells. So the little tiny room with a bed and a desk and a chair, that was a cell. And each of these looked just like that. He said they're little tiny cells. And so he coined the, the term cell and he's actually one of the individuals that is credited with the cell theory. So he was one of the individuals that helped in producing cell theory. Another thing he produced um, or he, he drew were what he called microscopic mushrooms. There they are. And I believe, there you go. Um, he didn't know what these were. He thought they were um, flowers. He was like, oh, these are microscopic flowers. Well, we know now that these were Rhizopus stolonifer, which is a common bread mold. But we did, But he didn't know this at the time. And so here's his compound microscope. So I, I, I tell you about these two and um, the reason they get their credit is because they both published. And so publication is key. There's another individual who does not get much credit, but he may have actually been the first in the 1500s to come up with a microscope. His name was Zacharias Janssen. He was a Dutch spectacle maker and he may have invented both a telescope and a simple microscope as well as a compound microscope in the late 1500s but because he was a very secretive individual and he never published anything there's nothing out there that says he did there's a lot of um, hypotheticals out there that that support that he might have published, but both um, Hook and Leeuwenhoek both published, um, both actually published with the Royal Society. And so we have um, information about them and that's why they get the credit and um, Zacharias does not. So let's jump into where microbes came from. We all know that life comes from life, but we've been taught that all of our life, right? Um, that's just the way it is. So back in the 1600s, the 1500s, the 1400s, um, and before, many people thought that life came from non-life. It just sp spontaneously appeared like magic. That was very slow and not very exciting. It's supposed to go purple, purple, purple all the way down and look all pretty, but whatever. Um, and so this is the theory of spontaneous generation. So you can take um, like dirty clothing, throw them into your cellar where you store your wheat. And after about 21 days time, you will have mice. And not only mice, but you'll have adult mice, not just baby mice. So life comes from non-life. This is the theory of spontaneous generation. This is actually a video that um, you can click on and watch. I'm not gonna watch it with you because I have learned that watching a video inside of a video is grounds for all kinds of problems. So let's just get into what is this theory. It is a theory that states that living organisms develop from non-living substances. So I told you about um, wheat grows mice, meat grows worms or flies. That's what um, people thought. And this was a theory. So um, in science, we use the scientific method, which, which you start out with a question, you 
you form a hypothesis, you test your hypothesis, you analyze your results, you come up with a conclusion that either supports or detracts from your hypothesis. And a theory is a hypothesis that has been supported over and over and over again. So it's basically what, what biologists would call a law in biology, but we don't have laws. The reason we don't have laws is because theories can be debunked. Laws don't get debunked. So the theory of spontaneous generation was what everybody believed. Everybody. Scientists believed this. The church believed this. And that means everybody else believed it. So when mom was talking to her children about where do babies come from, they just spontaneously occur because you're doing something right. You're, you're um, pleasing God, and so you're going to have a baby. That could be why. Um, if you do something wrong, you might get an infection. So there were supporters and detractors to this theory. Um, we're not going to talk about a lot of individuals, but we will talk about <laughs> more of the detractors than supporters. Um, there were, I mean, most people were in support. Most scientists were in support of this theory, as were um, the church, the clergy, and everybody followed the clergy. So if the clergy said this is how it is, then people just believed it. But there were people that said, no, I don't think this is right. Um, Francisco Reddy, Lazaro Spallanzani, Louis Pasteur, John Tyndall, and Ferdinand Cohn all helped in debunking this theory. So let's go through this theory really quick. Francisco Reddy, he was an Italian biologist and a physician. And what he did was he said, okay, we believe, or people believe that spontaneous generation is um, how living things are produced. So he took meat and he put one piece of meat into, in a jar that um, was open to the environment. And he put another piece of meat with, in a jar that was closed. Um, there was cheesecloth on it. Um, this allowed air to blow in but it did not allow for um, the flies to get into it. So his hypothesis was that um, the worms were coming from flies laying eggs. And in 1668, he um, showed that that's exactly what was happening. The gauze actually prevented flies from being able to deposit eggs, and so there was no worms on the rotting meat. But over here, you had worms because the flies could lay their eggs. And so people said, okay, so now people are like, whoa, this is wild. All right, maybe spontaneous generation works for smaller life forms, but not for large life forms like flies and, you know, humans. So they're like, okay, well, let's see. So what John Needham in 1748 did, he took infusions um, using hay, chicken, and other nutrients, and he put them into a jar and he boiled them. He then let the jar sit open to the environment, and after a couple of days, the jar was, was teeming with microbes. And he said, Look, microbes grow spontaneously. So maybe microbes can, are actually produced in this method. We know that there are microbes out there. Maybe these small life forms actually grow, are produced via spontaneous generation. And so then Lazaro Spallanzani said, all right, let me, let me disprove your hypothesis or your experiment. So he did the exact same experiment, but he capped or corked um, one set of flasks and he, 
or one flask and he un kept the other another flask uncorked so he did two experiments using the same um, chicken hay infusions the ones that were open to the environment were teeming with microbes after a day the one that was corked was not and Spallanzani said this proves that there are germs microbes in the air and they're getting in well the detractors or the supporters of spontaneous generation said no there's a vital force in the air and you didn't let it in so this didn't help it wasn't until 1861 when louis pasteur actually pr produced a swan neck flask and um so first he demonstrated that there are microbes in the air he used cotton and he filtered materials in the cotton through the cotton and um once he did that he proved um, by filtering air through the cotton and then he um, took the cotton he was able to find microbes so he knew there was microbes in the air and he thought well this is probably what is getting into those infusions that are opened so he made a swan neck flask the swan neck flask allowed air to get in but it this neck kept microbes from being able to move microbes are not very motile they can't move that effectively and so he boiled the same infusions and after he boiled them with this opening which allowed that vital force to get in um, nothing grew he could leave it sit for days weeks months even years and nothing would grow but as soon as he either tipped the flask so that the nutrients here got into that neck or if he broke the flask then uh, microbes got in and this is what debunked spontaneous generation finally so I'm gonna stop here I'm gonna start right on this slide in the next video so we're still talking about spontaneous generation but this has been a 17 minute video and I don't like to do videos that are much longer than 15 minutes in general so I'll post this one and get to the next video bye